All right. Welcome again, everybody. It's January 19th, 2023. And this is the Sustainable Beekeepers Guild monthly meeting and special presentation with our guest speaker, Corey Stevens. I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping items for everyone and make sure that uh, make sure that we got some uh, bases covered and get some important information out to you. Uh, make sure that your microphones are muted, uh, that if you do have a question you would like to ask the speaker during the presentation, you can go ahead and put that into the meeting chat and we will record that and queue those messages up for our uh, speaker and we'll stop at the times that are appropriate and hopefully interject it during the conversation um, and during the presentation so that he can answer your questions. There are going to be a lot of folks here tonight, so we'll try to get to everyone. But if your question is not answered, don't worry. We will do our best to make sure that that information gets over to Corey and uh, Corey can maybe answer those at a different time. All right. I wanna remind everybody about the purpose and the mission of the Sustainable Beekeeper Guild of Michigan, why we exist. I'm gonna read this off verbatim, so sorry if I bore you to tears. A collaborative and thoughtful mission fostered through education, intelligent dialogue, and practice that will carry out natural management of honeybees in Michigan, utilizing scientific principles grounded in naturalist theory, whilst promoting the chief end of a chemical-free and sustainable method of beekeeping and honey making. Our primary objective is to foster and develop a region of beekeepers focused on raising, exchanging, and utilizing local resource. The Guild will focus on education, mentoring, and support of hobbyists and sideliners to propagate local, sustainable survivor honeybee genetics and improve drone breeding populations that complement chemical-free and survival queen rearing practices. Don't ask me to say that three times fast. I don't think I could. Although open to beekeepers, hobbyists, sideliners, and the rest, the SBGMI primarily discourages prophylactic use of chemical treatments and defers to physical or mechanical manipulations and interventions first. What it means to use prophylactic treatment is to treat without monitoring, and that is primarily what we discourage sideliners and hobbyists from doing. Thus, the ultimate end will result in a culture striving to increase local colony resilience to pathogens, diseases, and reduce the risk and occurrence of treatment resistance in varroa destructor mites and other honeybee maladies. So we want to work together to build a region of sustainable honeybee genetics and better beekeepers. If you take a look at the uh, screen, you'll see the emails. If you want to get a hold of anybody that's currently uh, serving on the Guild um, board, there's the emails. You can get a hold of myself as the president. Vice President is Kyle Van Wagner. Our science chair is Matthew Kobe. And let's see. I'm going to mute that microphone there. All right. Uh, Treasurer and Secretary is Angie Ziegler. Our member at large is Joseph Kolb. And our member at large, which is representative of the virtual members in our group, is Jeff Wesolowski. If you have any general questions, you can also forward those to info at sbgmi.org. Our media presence can be found on our Facebook group for discussion, our website, and our YouTube channel, which we are actually publishing um, some of our conference videos from last year. And we'll talk about that here in a short bit. Couple of updates. The Sustainable Beekeepers Guild of Michigan now has 304 active memberships, which is pretty fantastic. We're overwhelmed by the support. We're very grateful for everyone that's been a part of the process and um, has joined the guild over the course of the last year. We have representation in over 32 states. A majority of them are in Michigan. However, we also have representation in over six countries. You know, for us, that's a huge, huge pat on the back um, for um, you know, the purpose that we're serving. And we're really, we're really grateful uh, that people are behind us. Our winter conference registrations, if you haven't heard about the conference yet, you probably have, um, is up to 134 as of the 19th, which is today. We also celebrated our one year anniversary this January and we were able to give away some uh, memberships. Over 48 people took advantage of that opportunity, which is about $1,000 worth of 
uh, memberships that were given away to the Michigan beekeeping community. So we're very proud of that too. We're always happy to help folks out, especially those that may be uh, unable to afford the membership and really looking for the education. The SBGMI also donated $750 worth of conference registrations and memberships to the Hive Life Youth Scholarship Fund. If you aren't familiar with Hive Life, uh, you probably will be soon. Uh, there is a silent auction for individuals um, in the youth beekeeping community and they raise funds to put them through uh, travel and their families to go to the Hive Life Conference every year, which is pretty cool. I also want to uh, remind you um, of our February 25th uh, conference, which will replace the February meeting. So if you are looking for a special meeting during the month of February, there will not be one. I also wanna remind you that we do have new beekeeper scholarships uh, for those that are interested, whether you're in Michigan or you are abroad. Um, and we offer membership to individuals who may be in the first or second year of beekeeping and looking for access to some of the content that we're putting out there. Also access to the members who have experience that can help you along your process. And more significantly, if you're losing your bees and you're just wondering what's going on and you really wanna get some help getting your bees even through a Northern winter, um, sharing that experience with people. So you don't give up, you don't just quit. Uh, those scholarships are offered for you. We're more than happy to give those away. As I said earlier, we are now publishing weekly. We're premiering our videos from the conference last year, 2022, which was previously available for members. Those will be premiering weekly on Mondays at five o'clock. You can find them on the SBGMI Media YouTube page. Um, there will be live chats that are associated with those. If you decided that you wanted to converse with others that are participating at that time, you don't have to be there at the premiere in order to see the video. It'll be live and available after five o'clock on those days. But if you felt like talking bees and talking about what you're hearing on the video chat, that would be um, pretty interesting for us bee nerds out there. Uh, those speakers will not be available during those broadcasts. So don't get mixed up thinking they'll be there and you're asking them questions and they're not answering. They won't talk to you because it's recording. So if you do sign up for the Bee Guild um, and you are interested in membership, some of what you could get is uh, listed right here on the screen. Individual memberships, $20 a year and family membership, which is yourself plus two members um, is $25 per year. If you have a large family and there's like nine folks, I don't think we're going to incrementally uh, charge you or prorate that. We can definitely make some exceptions for you. Uh, we want everybody to be able to participate. We encourage you strongly to become a member so you can benefit from some of these things, including the six months of uh, digital natural bee husbandry magazine, which is really cool to learn a lot about natural beekeeping, uh, keeping bees in skeps, uh, log hives, things of that sort, where folks are actually doing some things with rewilding honeybees and really studying how that affects um, honeybee populations in the wild. Access to members only content, discounts on the American Bee Journal and Bee Culture magazines. Those forms and codes are in the member section. And when you do register, you are able to uh, get access to that information so you can take advantage of those discounts. We also are offering a discounted access to our second annual virtual conference and the recordings thereafter. So you get access to the recordings for a full year after you register for the conference. The beauty of the conference is you don't have to be there the day of to watch these um, presentations. While it's nice to be able to spend that time participating in the virtual conference, it's going to be a long day for some of us. And you can always come back and check in later and see those videos once they've been uploaded. Uh, the discount is $20 off. You can get the member code from the member section. If you do sign up and just purchase the registration for the conference, you'll automatically receive the annual membership and still have access to that recording. So they're paired together. You also get uh, additional access to the premium virtual talks that are offered regularly through our social media mediums. So that's a lot. I actually think it's fairly worth it. Some of the subscriptions and the discounts um, that you're getting on the magazines alone are worth that um, $20. Here's the advertisement for our virtual winter conference. Um, you can see our speaker lineup is pretty stellar. We're very excited. We're really excited for Dr. John Harbo to talk to us about finding Varroa sensitive hygiene and how you can retain it specifically as a hobbyist or a small scale beekeeper. Um, Dr. John's um, you know, desire is that everybody can have the opportunity or the access to doing these things without having lab equipment available to them. So that's gonna be a presentation worth coming for alone. If you only come for one, I think that's the one you wanna be at. 
We want to give special thanks to some of the sponsors for the conference and acknowledge you guys here right now. It's just really excellent that we've got the support that we have. We have Kobe Apiaries, who's uh, willing to give some of this top-notch, top-tier hot honey. If you haven't heard about it, probably will. Um, Natural Bee Husbandry Magazine and Northern Bee Books. The Miller Bee Supply is giving away some gift certificates at the conference. So if you are registered, everybody will receive an automatic registration um, for that opportunity. We'll draw uh, winners throughout the course of the conference. Heffernan's Honey and Beekeeping Supply is a local Michigan um, beekeeping product supplier, and he is giving away a special package, including a bee suit, a smoker, and a hive tool. And we also have Broodminder that's given us some T2 monitoring equipment to give away to some of the lucky recipients. Flannery Ridge Honey is also a beekeeping woodware supplier is offering a $100 gift certificate. So if you're local, you'll be able to receive a $100 gift certificate to go shop in his store. Um, and if you haven't used or received any of his equipment, it's pretty, pretty good stuff. It's top notch. I personally use Ryan Flannery um, for my beekeeping equipment needs. Cold Bee Farm will be offering a medium five frame, I'm sorry, a deep five frame uh, honeybee nuke, Cleus Colony. You'll be able to pick that up from him in the spring. Don't forget Stevens Bee Company, who is here tonight. Corey Stevens will be offering um, one lucky winner, a BSH queen, a high ranking, super duper, top notch, Mike Killer queen. And then we will be offering a Sustainable Beekeepers Guild of Michigan lifetime membership giveaway. Um, so one lucky winner will get lifetime membership. Now, that's forever. And as long as we can keep the uh, codes in the membership at the highest uh, year counter on there, you'll be there until um, that expires. All right. So tonight's guest, uh, some of us, there's no need for um, introduction. However, for those of us who are not so familiar with Corey's work, um, Corey Stevens uh, first came known to me, I think it's 2018 or 2019, um, when I first started investigating, you know, beekeeping, uh, I heard about Corey. And um, Corey Stevens has been keeping bees for 14 years. Is it 14 now? He tends 27 acre farm in Bloomfield, Missouri, which he manages for wildlife and pollinator habitat. Corey and his wife, Jamie, managed the Stevens Bee Company with the help of their two children, Jade, Olivia, and Camden. Corey is also past president of the Missouri State Beekeepers Association and is, a newly, minted, uh, is newly minted with his MS in entomology. And uh, a lot of us are strongly encouraging to go on to the next step. He got that entomology degree from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He was certified as a master beekeeper by the Eastern Apicultural Society in 2013 and trained by Sue Kobe in 2014 to instrumentally, uh, instrumentally inseminate queens. He slips bees into random conversations with strangers and annoys his wife by constantly talking about bees. And with that said, Corey, do you have access to your screen? Yes, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, we can hear you. Okay, I'm not using a, a mic or anything, it's just on my computer. Should be fine. Excellent. <clears throat> you wanna go ahead with a screen share? Screen share, yep, it's all yours. I wanna just give a quick reminder to everybody, if you have a question for Corey during the presentation, don't hesitate to put that up there in the chat. We've got a couple of people monitoring questions and we'll make sure that we can insert those into the conversation as we go throughout tonight's presentation. All right. Yeah, whenever I've got this pulled up, I can't see the chat. So I think if we just put questions in the chat, is that what you just said, James? <laughs> yep, we're gonna, we're gonna monitor them so you can focus on your presentation. You don't gotta worry about catching them. Sweet. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming this evening. I'm gonna cover here a virgin queen intro, <clears throat> but it's gonna be more than that too. So um, let's get into it. Let's see here. There we go. <clears throat> I wanted to first start off with a slide that I would call uh, advantages for using virgin queen. So whenever I first started this, I think 
I was around a lot of commercial beekeepers and that was probably a, a this would be a laughable topic among them like it seems like it was kind of virgin queens were kind of rejected by um, commercial guys you know with probably issues with introduction and whatnot so you know they were either using mated queens or cells so I started raising my own queens and then just kind of by the process of evolution I started to use virgin queens and this is the first reason why I started to use them because I was already, you know, using breeder queens and I, I really wanted, I didn't have a ton of bees, but I wanted to make the best use of my nucleus colonies. And so I would make up a bunch of cells and make up nukes. But then I found out that even some of these cells like uh, that are pictured here in my incubator that look really good, they were well fed and at some point <clears throat> you know in their development they just died but they look like, like textbook quality cells so that's really annoying if, if you're going to dig in your other colonies and rob brood and take the time to make a nucleus as i thought the proper way and move it and everything um, it was really annoying to have cells that were non-viable which i've kind of gotten around that too so you know, I'll pull them out of these cell protectors and I'll squeeze the wax height and then I'll break, actually break that plastic JZBZ cup off the queen cell and you can look in there and see what they look like. You can see if they've, you know, aborted and died or if they're wiggling around or whatever. And you can actually just make sure you don't pinch your feet, but you can just stick it back on there and use it just like you would a cell. So if I sell queen cells, they've already been peeked in. So heavy culling, that was the main advantage, I think, that I saw initially with using virgin queens is I wasn't wasting nukes on cells that look good but weren't good. So like I said, less wasted nukes on non-viable cells. And I gave you a hack or a way around that, but <clears throat> still, you know, I wanted to be able to cull them and make sure, you know, they have six legs and their wings and you can cull if there's any smalls. Sometimes you'll have one that just doesn't develop right and she's tiny. I would never want that to get out. I wouldn't want it in my own yard and definitely wouldn't want it going to a customer either. So you can pinch the smalls or any deformities or anything that's outside of what you want. Um, this is another thing. Like some people push me to ship queen cells and I've done it reluctantly and i ship next day air only <clears throat> but i ship it enough to know that ups does a really amazing job most of the time but there's always a shipment or two that slips through the cracks most of the time it's just for a day or so but a day an extra day of transit with ripe queen cells is a death sentence and I guarantee live delivery, so <clears throat> I would have to eat them. Like if they missed delivery, I'd have to eat them and uh, send them a whole new batch. So, but if you miss a day with Virgin Queens and they show up the next day, no worries. As long as UPS didn't cook them or something. This is something I hadn't thought about until I had a uh, conversation with Allie McAfee that writes for ABJ. She was doing a study on uh, sperm viability issues in reference to shipping. So if the temperature got elevated, it wasn't high enough to kill the bees, but <clears throat> it would kill some of the sperm in the spermatheca. So the queen, you know, whenever this may be some problems that people think are breeders, you know, whenever they're drone layers or partial drone layers, it could be that they were in really good shape when they I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, of course, but it could be that they just had some higher than normal temperatures and, you know, the sperm was damaged in her spermatheca. But if you ship virgins, they haven't made it yet. So <clears throat> there's no risk of, of uh, sperm viability issues because, you know, they take care of that when they get to your place. This is the bottom line right here. I mean, everything else I've mentioned before that's really just icing on the cake. Um, I used to sell open mated queens. <clears throat> I'm not in South Florida. I'm not in South Texas. Um, I'm not that close to the Gulf. 
So I don't have as long of a season as some of these guys. And it got to where I don't remember what I was selling them for 30 bucks, which was a, <clears throat> you know, this was several years ago, but it was a pretty good price for an open mated queen, but people kept buying them and wanted more of them. And uh, then I would just did kind of some simple math because nucleus colonies kept climbing up there now, oh, man, I think they're like 220 in Missouri, 225 sometimes, you know, even inexpensive ones. 175 bucks you know something like that so i started doing the math of because i would let my queen sit like bob benny mentioned at hive life the longer those things are in there the better they are and i'm i will not sacrifice quality so i would let them sit in a nuke like a month you know and i could only do maybe two and a half rounds you know so what is that 60 you know, best case scenario, if I did three rounds, that's 90 bucks. So after all that work of making those nukes and trying to get a queen right, and they don't all get queen right, um, you know, I could work really hard for 90 bucks, or I could just sell the nuke out of it for 185 and make twice as much money and not be messing with mating nukes. So now keep in mind, I have a day job. You know, if I didn't, I might look at mated queens as an income source, you know, potentially, but from my perspective, they just weren't worth it. And, you know, I was wanting to produce instrumentally inseminated breeder queens too. So <clears throat> I ditched the open mated queen to a lot of people's <clears throat> dismay. Still to this day, I always, you know, catch a little bit of grief for not selling open mated queens, but hey, you know, it's just, it's not my game. So I would say the main advantage is more profit. Here's the thing too, like it's something to think about. If you've got people like me that are just passionate breeders and they're just bee breeders and you want what they have, <clears throat> I mean, I can't produce enough open mated queens for you, but I can make, you know, thousands of queens over the course of, you know, April, May and mid June. So that just unleashes my potential, you know, because I don't have enough bees, you know, I'm only running like 150 colonies. I've got enough for 200 or close to it, but I don't have that many. So, you know, I could make a lot more out of what I have breed and then make a ton of Queens, um, you know, and then I wouldn't, it, it basically unbridled some potential and, and gave me a lot more profit. And here's something I think that we'll see more of going forward. I call it like the micro breeder model. It's people that like me that are passionate breeders that are kind of doing their own thing and maybe they're doing something unique, you know, and it's something you want. Well, <clears throat> if it's more profitable and they're not tied with, you know, open mating and adding that month onto every queen and, and can just crank out a ton of high quality queens, um, it's more profitable and I, I look at it kind of like the craft beer industry you know how that's really taken off where the people do their own thing or put their own spin on it and there's enough profit on it that they'll keep doing it well this will indirectly you know I've heard people say in the past oh you know we're we have too much inbreeding and we don't have enough alleles sex alleles in our U.S. population you know it's a good excuse to import cool stock don't get me wrong I mean, that's fun, but really, if we have our, our, our operations, our breeding operations spread out and there's a lot of diversity and everybody's kind of making their own novel combinations and doing their own thing, we don't have an inbreeding issue even a little bit. <clears throat> so if I jack around and get some inbreeding because I'm not paying attention or I've made too many SDIs or single drone inseminations, you know, I can get something from James in Michigan or or whoever else and outcross it and then inbreeding is no longer a, an issue. So hopefully we see more micro breeders pop up. And I think that if they produce virgins and it's profitable for them, then that's what's gonna drive the industry. If there's no profit in it, nobody's gonna do it except crazy people that are obsessed like me. <clears throat> Queen rearing. 
I was thinking about, you know, I can tell you how to introduce a virgin queen in probably about five minutes, and James would probably want more for his money than five minutes worth. So I thought I would start with kind of what I do with queen rearing and then walk people through you know, how I take care of virgins. <clears throat> so like just to touch on queen rearing and not get too deep, I use large queenless starter finishers. They have to be well fed. Um, I want them to display prior signs of swarming. You know, like a lot of people will make a cell builder so they'll just put brood in a box. And But really what is a cell builder? It's just a colony of bees, you know, and if I wait till they're monster colonies, big double deeps that are just stacked with bees and they're already wanting to make queen cells, I don't have to convince them of anything. Because if, if you have had the same experience as me trying to convince bees of something they're not in the mood for, good luck with that. And that's why a lot of people have failed with queen rearing because their cell builders were totally not interested in what they were doing. But Hey, Corey. Yeah, you might you might be on your way to this one, but what's your favorite baseline model queen uh, queenless starter finisher setup? Like, how would you give a Cliff Notes version of how you set that up for yourself? Yeah, this is <clears throat> it's really simple. Whenever I like displaying prior signs of swarming, whenever I find a big double deep that's super healthy and stacked with resources, and they're making queen cells to throw a giant swarm out into the trees, that's exactly what I want but I'll take the old queen out and take any swarm cells out and like immediately graft into it. And then I feed them heavily with thin syrup, like two parts water to one part sugar, because it's really stimulative, like nectar is stimulative. It's actually the similar sugar content, like 33, 30% uh, sugar and you know the rest water, super thin. And so I'll use those for three weeks. I just take whatever I get the first week. The second week I'll go back and usually there's some that are contrary and will make some emergency cells. Well, I go in and whack all those. You gotta go through every frame and then I'll graft again. And then your take goes through the roof because you have, it's just loaded with nurse bees. And the only thing they have to feed are these wonderful larvae and these jay-z bz cups pictured on the right and then the third week's a breeze because well I, I keep a weekly schedule sorry in case you didn't deduce that like i graft every monday i have a day job <clears throat> unfortunately and so i'll graft every monday and then every weekend i've got queens emerging and then the following week i'm shipping virgins after i put attendance in so to answer your question, James, that's kind of it. It's just large double deep colonies that are super strong and are wanting to swarm. And you know, not everybody wants to swarm at once. So I'll use them for three weeks and then I'll have a different batch of, of uh, colonies that got really big and wanted to swarm and they'll be cell builders and so on and so forth. And you kind of put yourself at an advantage when you catch one of your colonies on the verge of swarming or having already started swarm cells because you're gonna have a, a little to no um, uh, eggs and larvae to contend with because the queen will have been shut down. Yeah, that's an advanced swarming. Yeah, yeah, I occasionally catch them like that. But, you know, and you can see here, I only put two bars in, so it's like 40 graphs and that's for a big double deep. You can put 60 in there, but they'll just get a little bit smaller. And I'm doing instrumental insemination and whatnot, so I wanna be highest quality fattest queens ever and so i only put 40 in there and so you know i'll put 40 in for three weeks that's 120 graphs and if i get really good take all three rounds which is not uncommon especially if they're already swarming you know i'll get 100 queens out of it per se so i mean Excellent. even if i sold them for 15 dollars each as queen cells that's what i sell queen cells for I kind of bumped it up from that historically low commercial price, but I, I was doing something different too. So anyway, you can let your colony swarm, you know, and you lose whatever, however many bees, or you can put them to work like I do here and make a hundred queens out of it, you know? So to me, a swarm is wasted resources. 
I say wasted from a reproductive standpoint, the bees are super happy with it. But see, I'm kind of coinciding my goals with theirs. They're wanting to reproduce. Okay, let's make a hundred queens. You know, that's reproduction. Actually, you know, the, I'm helping them sow their wild oats a lot more than they would even be capable of because those things go all over the U.S. whenever I ship them. Anyway, I feel like I'm rambling there, James. That I cover your question no no yep you, you covered it just just perfectly thank you for the side the side trail there yeah so like i mentioned a bit ago <clears throat> i keep a strict weekly grafting schedule and i've got queens every weekend and then once i've got queens every weekend after we do vsh testing and, and whatnot and i know where my breeder colonies are that i want to reproduce then it's easy to like clockwork, I have to use nine or 10 day old virgins. So it just, you know, I've got queen rearing and I've got my shipping schedule and then I'll layer my instrumental insemination schedule on top of it. And then I, I definitely have no life at that point. Like Friday night, I'm extracting drones till Saturday morning at one or 2 a.m. You know, that way I can inseminate uh, and ship <clears throat> breeder queens which I've cut back on this year, but maybe we'll touch on that too, James, my little project I'm working on. But cells are inspected multiple times per day. So like I said, I know exactly when I grafted them. I know exactly when they're going to come out and luck and my kids, God bless them. They've handled more Queens than most. They don't even really care about these that much, but they've handled more Queens than most people ever dream about handling because they're you know I have hundreds coming out each weekend <clears throat> and they're putting them in candy cages for me so as soon as they're moving as soon as they're wiggling either they're out or like I said I would break this cell open and look down in this to see if it's viable if she's wiggling around already most of the time we just shake her out put her in a cage and move on that way we don't have to check her again like kind of expedites the process And they're put into candy cages immediately. If you don't, they'll start to curl up. Your profit starts going down. <clears throat> Care of virgin queens. This is something I've, it took me years of trial and error to do, figure out some of this stuff, but that's what I want my virgin queens to look like. That one on my thumb, it's like a fat mated queen. Like I mentioned before, you got to put them in candy cages really quickly after they emerge. <clears throat> and then you've got a little bit of time. Like if the weather's not great, you know, you can keep them in those candy cages by themselves for upwards of 48 hours. And then you're going to start losing a bunch of them if you don't add attendance. And if you don't water them, you're going to lose a bunch of them too. You got to, you have to water them daily. Like as soon as you catch attendance, they're not going to be thirsty, but starting the next day, you'll have to water them. <clears throat> that's something people don't think about and like i'll store them in the incubator once i put attendants in there um this is the hova genesis you know i would that incubator behind my thumb there behind that queen i would recommend those they're ridiculously reliable i went to like a big cabinet style incubator because i have starting to move so many queens but I mean, you can grow a lot in these, that uh, Hova Genesis. And after I've mastered how, which attendants to pick and making sure you get attendants that are gonna take care of your queens and you actually water daily, sometimes two times daily, I can hold queens for a couple weeks in an incubator. No, I mean, I wouldn't advise that, but I can easily keep them super fresh and taken care of until the insemination date, um, you know, or you can bank, bank them. Bank, banks can be finicky at times, but, you know, if you've got a good bank, they'll take good care of it. Like those cell builders after they've done three rounds of queens, those are phenomenal banks. You know, they'll take care of those queens really well. But... <laughs> learn from the burn so i 
James mentioned like around 2014, I learned instrumental insemination. So in 2015, I was really playing with it and getting used to it and, and figuring everything out because it's a complex procedure and introducing queens is a complex procedure. I mean, you're, you're stacking complex stuff on top of complex stuff here. So a lot can go wrong. Um, I would make nukes because Sue, I learned from Sue Kobe, she said, if you could keep those queens in their nukes, you know, pretty much the whole time prior to insemination, she's not a stranger to them, you know? So her thought was they're already used to her. You can write the nuke number on the cage. And then whenever you do your inseminations you go back and put everybody back where they're supposed to go. I'd feed thin syrup, just like I do cell builders um, to get them fat, ready to feed brood and, and to reduce stress. So I would inseminate them on day nine or 10. So, you know, I, I would make the nukes up, you know, well before that and just, just like you see in this picture, only I would put a cap over the end of it. That one's actually getting released, but I'd put a cap over the candy so they can't turn her loose. And then this was one thing Sue really stressed was the ability of the queens after they wake up, after you've inseminated them, where they can run around like it aids sperm migration. So I would just wait till the queens woke up and then I would just direct release them down in there. And they fed them really well. So I put here, <laughs> the workers fed the virgin queens well before sacrificing them to their gods. I don't know what they sacrificed them to, but I do know that they were killed. Whether it was for an unnamed God, I'm not certain, but they would routinely murder these queens that I put so much effort into. And while I was conducting the crime scene investigations of why they murdered all my uh, inseminated breeder queens, every single one of them had queen cells in there. So... Then I was like, oh, this is war. So I'm like, well, what do, what do I do if, before I turn these loose, like the day before I'm inseminating, go through there and whack all those cells? So they've sat for a week, probably. Um, as long as it's seven to nine days, which I'll get into in this next slide. That, that's how the Stevens method was born, out of pain, suffering, and failure. But that's whenever I got smart. I found out that if I would cut those queen cells out seven to nine days after I made that split, um, that was the key. They were screwed then. Because if you think about it, you know, like a queen will lay an egg. So she'll be an egg for three days. She will be in the perfect age to raise a queen out of on day four. That's four days after you made your split. They have ideal aged larvae from those eggs day five not ideal aged but if it's between them and death trust me they will will raise queen cells out of it day six maybe but if you get to day seven eight or nine there is nothing there's no larvae in there that they even have a prayer of raising a queen out of that's where i came up with a seven to nine day thing and so I kept saying the bees were then hopelessly queenless. Like I, I described what I just described to you, like to my mentor, Sue Kobe, even this last year. And I was like, here's what I do. And I told her, and I'm like, they're hopelessly queenless. And she would like scrunch up her face. I could tell she's like, no, I don't like that idea at all. And I told Bob Benny that too <laughs> at the Missouri conference. And he's kind of shaking his head like, so that's how I knew this wasn't something that had been uh, widely circulated. It was like a new concept, I would say. I had not heard anyone say it prior to me discovering this. So I, I call it the Stevens method. If somebody else came up with it sooner, sorry. With nothing to raise a queen from, acceptance skyrocketed. So like I quit having, you know, the bees quit sacrificing my queens. And then you get ones like that's pictured here, big, beautiful, inseminated queens. And then I figured out too that, because <clears throat> some people struggle with even open mated queens. Now they're, they're easier 
open mated queens are easier to introduce because they have that full pheromone profile. So it automatically suppresses the workers urge to make a queen. So it kind of gets suppresses that queenless factor. So, you know, you get a lot better acceptance with standard practices with an open mated queen. But the thing is too, is I got kicked back like from my commercial buddies, like that's an extra step. There's no way that commercial beekeepers will do that, you know, because it's like you just doubled your labor, which is a good point. But the thing is too, is like I've done side by side comparisons where I'd held virgins. Like I made a split and just taped over the candy cage and stuck them in there. And like I said, they'll feed them great. But if they have something to make cells out of, as soon as she's out of that candy, they'll murder her. And then I did some where I held them a week and then I brought in some new splits and I cheated and peeked in all the cells so I know they're viable. I dropped queen cells in these new splits that were probably split earlier that day. And now this is a small sample size, but every single one of those virgin queens, I cut queen cells and untaped them or uncapped them and then let them candy release so they weren't out till the next day. Every single one of those that I split and put queen cells in, they killed my, and I know they're viable because I peeked in there and looked, they killed all my queen cells and started their own. So I know it's a labor saver, but if you really want to know that whatever cell you're sticking in that nuke, you want to know for sure it was the genetics out of those cells, you pretty much have to do the same thing like I did. You can pull all this, the brood up over an excluder and let it set for seven or eight days, and then, you know, make your splits and cut cells as you're adding them to the box, you know, whatever you want to do, you can either split them and move them, whack the cells and add add queen cells of yours or add virgins or you know you can pull it up over an excluder and let it set either way whatever way to make them feel queenless so and you have to hit that seven to nine day window because <laughs> if you don't remove the cells obviously you know your emergency queens are going to start hatching and then you've got issues this is whenever, like I figured that out mechanically, how I described to you, because I was doing the math uh, of waiting them out till they didn't have any uh, available larvae they could make a queen out of. But then it also dawned on me, this mirrors nature. What happens whenever a, a colony is in, a, in an advanced swarming state? What happens? What does the queen do or not do? She stops laying eggs to slim down. <clears throat> so oftentimes, whenever virgin queens are released naturally in a colony, there are no eggs and there are no young larvae. Not always, you know, but they're in an advanced swarming state. They're primed to accept virgins, case in point. Or there's no competition. There's no eggs, no young larvae. You know, the swarm is uh, ready to take off. The queen quit laying some time ago so she could, you know, get her beach bod on and slim down and get ready to fly. So that's how it kind of came full circle for me whenever I realized it mirrored natural conditions. Like, you know, in nature, this is how, this is the environment that virgins are entering for maximum acceptance. That's how the Stevens method of virgin queen intro <laughs> was born <clears throat> okay you know james likes to talk about sustainability you know who who doesn't that really wants to get something out of whatever it is they're doing whether it's whatever agricultural venture it is farming whatever you want to be sustainable and you want to be profitable oh man i messed up the animation here <clears throat> anyway so raising your own queens, I think, is an absolute key to sustainability. I mean, unless your buddy's selling them super cheap, you know, that may be the <laughs> may be the key to sustainability, but a reliable supply of queens because, you know, they age out. Things happen, you know, like queen issues are a big deal. 
you know, probably as much as Varroa. Maybe it's caused by Varroa to some degree. I don't know. But I know that I had an expensive hobby slash addiction that my wife was constantly questioning because she's the accountant type. And then I figured out once I learned how to raise queens, like it went from expensive hobby to, yeah, I'm starting to sell queens, you know, starting to make a little money instead of just paying everybody else for wooden wear or queens or whatever. So it turned uh, my expensive hobby to a nice little side hustle, which I hope to, it, to grow it into a quit my day job side hustle. So <clears throat> what I was doing was I was using VSH breeders, but I was just open mating them to just stock I'd caught, you know, in the area that did well. And those were, man, they were harder to kill. Uh, you know, I was using Tom Glenn, VSH Italians, and like the old school Paul lines. Man, those were good. <clears throat> then I would open made them to my Missouri mutts. And yeah, it just, my the whole look of my apiaries did a 180. And then I'm pulling frames like this, you know, and watching for swarms hanging in a tree rather than limping these little puny colonies along. And it was a game changer. So another thing, you know, <clears throat> nothing against bringing in bees or buying stuff, packages, you know, and whatnot. I know a lot of good people that produce them and, um, you know, do their best to produce a quality product. But anytime you're moving bees or you're moving comb, that's why some of these states are so strict about comb movement is because that's where a lot of pathogen transfer comes from you know like the migratory guys will tell you you know a lot of times they're under some heavy mite loads just from one area to another and so not to you know try to cut everybody off that's making a living down there but just to kind of minimize incoming packages and nukes and kind of make your own state or your own area more sustainable and if you've got people that are doing some breeding work like some micro breeders or you know or you buy from me i like to i like it when people buy my bees too so you know you can you can start making your own splits and start raising your own queens <clears throat> and it seems like whenever you need a queen you know as a hobbyist or even a sideliner whenever you need one they're impossible to find because everybody else needs one too but if you make a bunch of nukes like ian stepler talks about his nuke battery if you have a bunch of nukes sitting back especially with brood frames looking like this and you got a queen that's crapping out. I mean, I just, I just dropped the whole nuke in there. It's like a steroid shot, brand new queen, new genetics, and then several brood frames. And I'll put her in a candy cage. That's the only time I candy release queens as if it's like a hostile takeover. If I put their whole nuke in a colony, cause they take them extremely well. <clears throat> so, you know, raising your own queens and and doing a little bit of your own stock selection um, you can kind of minimize a lot of that stuff that's coming in because not all of it's good uh, some of it is extremely susceptible and you know, some of them produce a lot of honey but they just cannot handle mites period like zero mite resistance okay i didn't get a lot of questions during that what? Oh well, we've got some we've got some questions uh, queued up for you, Corey. Um, kind of want to do a little bit of a, a a rewind, and you know, a lot of folks here are are pretty familiar with you. Um, there are also a lot of folks who, who are not necessarily familiar with your operation. But um, one of the questions uh, that came up is, uh, it's kind of a two part. So I'll give you the first one, and then uh, follow up with the second once you answer. So the first question is, can you tell us what makes your process and your genetics unique from another, let's say, queen supplier? Okay, that's a good question. <clears throat> well, I've been hung up on resistance mechanisms for as long as I've been for oh, well over a decade. You know, I started raising queens about my third year of beekeeping, and that was I was already obsessed with host resistance because i was thinking if i'm going to raise queens i don't want to be 
you know, raising queens like whatever I just bought because, man, there's got to be something better out there, you know, because they'd get chalk brewed and just I'd have terrible winter survival. Just you're just trying to limp them along. You know, I didn't want to I didn't want to reproduce that. So I was obsessed with getting something different. So all along, I've used different VSH lines. They're not all created equal. Some are better than others. And they don't all score the same either. So, I mean, that might be opening up a can of worms, but I would say what's different about my stock is a heavy VSH influence. We started testing our own, you know, in-house doing Harbo VSH assays several years ago. And, you know, I quit bringing stock in. So, it's like a page laid law, closed population breeding model. So I've got a ton of diversity and now we're selecting our, our own stuff. And a lot of people know or may not know, but <clears throat> I haven't used any and I'm not influencing other people to do this. It's a difficult path, but I haven't used any chemical miticides, antibiotics, fumigil, anything in over a decade whenever i started bringing in vsh breeders like i just stopped to see what would happen because i knew i wanted to breed and to me that was the quickest way to see what those bees had or didn't have is just to let nature take her gloves off and go a few rounds with them and it was pretty obvious not all bees are created equal there so i would say that's what's different about my stock is you know i i use natural selection first and foremost and then i apply master beekeeper if you will selection criteria and then vsh assays are the final hurdle to see if you get to stay in the breeding pool or not so and you know everybody's going to have a different focus but i try to breed something that's commercially viable because i have a lot of commercial beekeeping buddies and i mean I've said in the past, you know, I'm not breeding Tom Seeley bees. I didn't mean, I hope someone didn't take that as a, a shot at Tom and all the great work he's done. But, you know, if you think of a Seeley bee, like the ones he was studying that had kind of natural resistance is they just wouldn't leave a 10 frame deep. You know, they were small colonies that would raise brood sparingly. They swarmed a ton, you know, they would have a lot of brood breaks. And like, that's a nightmare of a bee from a commercial standpoint. They're not gonna make honey. You're not gonna have a lot of ton of brood to make splits with. Like they're alive though. And that resistance trait set has its place, but that wasn't what I was wanting to breed. So my, my stock has more of a commercial influence. I would say, you know, like big, bigger colonies cause those are gonna be the ones that produce honey. Um, just robust, you know, larger robust bees. If that answers so you would, the question. Yeah, so you would say that fecundity is important, um, being able to brood up and provide the numbers that are necessary for uh, large honey crops, as yeah, well as. Or, or making nucleus colonies. Either way, you got to have a lot of bees to make nukes or honey, whichever way you're looking at it. So, So brooding is definitely important. I would say, yeah, brooding, but more so, or more specifically, I would say response to nutrition. So I don't want them to eat themselves out of house and home and me have to be feeding them constantly. But at the same time, like whenever spring hits and there's nectar and pollen coming in, like I want them to be monsters and just grow and take off, you know, and then if, if, the nectar shuts off, kind of tone it down, you know, not like a historical Italian, so to speak. So, you know, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm, where I'm aiming for. Okay. So the follow-up to the question was, what is it about your operation that has brought you to where you are today with queen production and VSH genetics? Um, specifically, like, what is it that you have found to be, um, you know, kind of your go your go to when it comes to your selective means. 
Well, I could be reading that wrong, but could you perceive that question as like keys to success or what's made me? Is that a incorrect? yeah? What is it like? What is it about your operation that's brought you where you are today? Like where you and where did you start out? Where where are you at today? Um, and you know how I, has that kind of matured? I started running just whatever you know, like I would order queens from Kelly Bees or you know people in some commercial producers in Georgia and whatnot. And that's where I was mentioning, like having some chalk brood problems and such, you know, and uh, my issues, of course, too. But then I started using VSH stock. So I would say the two keys to success, the first one is host resistance. So I think VSH is the most straightforward. It addresses the root cause, which is Varroa reproduction. They shut Varroa reproduction down. They're technically hygienic, so you don't see chalk brood, you don't see American fowl brood, and coincidentally, they have extremely strong viral resistance, which if you watch some of Kara Wagner's stuff coming out, um, she kind of touches on that with UBO. They noticed the viral loads were really low, and I noticed that too because I would use F1, so it was just a virgin queen I'd raised from some Tom Glenn stock, and I would get in my colonies that had you a lot of you know uh what withered wings look like it's parasitic mite syndrome like their wings look like two little pieces of yarn well i would get in some of my colonies and i would see a bunch of bees like that and i would just switch the queen out i would take the susceptible queen out and kill her and switch it out with a vsh queen i would not put anything on them no fluvalinate no formic nothing i would just wait and see what they did because I'm somewhat of a scientist, so just out of curiosity, I wanted to see what happened. And within six to eight weeks, I would go back in there, and zero bees had deformed wing virus every single time I would do that. So it wasn't a fluke. I mean, it was <clears throat> night and day. So I knew I, could, I wasn't smart enough to articulate what it was. I just knew they had strong viral resistance. That's all I could say. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the mechanism is, but they clean it up, whatever it is. And I've told other people too, but like Randy Oliver was wanting samples of untreated apiaries. So they could, he was wanting to test for A, B, and C strain deformed wing virus. This was years ago. And he wanted some uh, like people that were treatment free that weren't treating their bees, probably so they could point and laugh, you know, at how t terrible or ate up with viruses those bees were. And I cheated and sent him samples. They were un untreated, but they were all VSHF ones that I took samples of. And the test results came back BL, BL, and no. So Deform wing virus A was below quantifiable levels. It's there, but there's not even enough there to quantify it. There's just very, very low levels of it. Deform wing virus B, BL, below quantifiable levels, extremely, extremely low. And C, no, non existent. It's not there. So that was mind blowing. But I knew they had viral resistance because I was, I've, saw what was happening in the field you know i had just field observation beekeeper field observation but i didn't know what mechanism it was but i think that vshbs know that the brood is sick or something's wrong with it and they throw it out so before that you know nurse bee comes out that has a high viral load and starts feeding everyone else all the other brood and giving them a high viral load the SHBs kick them to the curb. So it's so cool. You know, that's why I picked VSH because it's multifaceted. So like it controls Varroa reproduction. They'll still get mites. You know, they'll still get from robbing or drifting or however they pick the little buggers up, but they'll still get them. <clears throat> but if you measure them, like if it's a level four on a Harbo scale, they allow 0% mite reproduction. So you might start to get a mite load in there, but they're not letting any of them reproduce. You know, and if they're a three, that's pretty good. They've suppressed a lot of the reproduction, but there's still a few that are getting through the ra their radar. 
but <clears throat> I've seen you can get strong double deep colonies with multiple supers loaded sitting on top of them full of bees and get 100% suppressed mite reproduction out of them. I mean, I've seen it with my own eyes. So not all VSH are created equal and not, not all VSH are VSH, unfortunately. Um, but you can test them and find out for yourself, you know, it wasn't a hard so one. You're, so you're essentially saying that through your, through your assays or the, the, the means in which you test the mite reproduction in your colonies that you're selecting your, your breeder stock from, which in turn generates the, the virgin queens that you sell and the cells that you ship and things of that sort are the cells that you sell locally. Right. That, that you're observing not just the suppression of the mite reproduction um, and the low mite loads, but, but they're that they're, they're keeping reproductive mites out of the colony altogether. Yeah. And they're it, productive. It, it, the fours are, I mean, if you buy a bunch of virgins and you test all of them, they're not all going to be fours. Like a, a lot of them are, but it seems like uh, probably the longer I run my model, because I, like I said, I'm not bringing in any other stock before I was crossing, like I use a little bit of VP, I'd use a little bit of Harbo, you know, I had Glenn back in the day and now I just quit bringing in anything. I'm just letting my model run itself. So I think they're getting stronger by the year because not everybody selects the same way and everybody wants something different. And I'm ruthless when it comes to mine because I let, like I said, I let mother nature take her gloves off with my bees. So they've had some level of selection, but like the, I'm bouncing around a little bit, but I think the two keys to success were VSH and raising my own queens. Like, even if you're not a VSH person, <clears throat> you should look at, if you haven't started raising your own queens, you should invest some time in that. It's really worth it um, for the bottom line and not having to buy queens all the time. And then you can raise queens from the ones that you like that did good wherever it is that you reside to. So you're kind of selecting for a natural or a more localized bee. You know, whether you have harsh winters, you know, but the thing is, though, is like if your bees can control mites on their own to a high degree and they're aggressive foragers and they'll put up a lot of stores, it doesn't really matter where you send them. Like I've got bees that are people running my queens in the south. I've got them in California. I've got some in the mountains and, you know, out west, the mountains out east. And there's a bunch like you know, really far north, you know, one person was close to the Canadian border in Montana, you know, and had good luck with them. So I think if you get a bee that can control mites on its own, you know, you can help them if you need to, but at least be able to handle their own to some degree and put up a lot of stores. I mean, you know, what's going to kill them? So, so, uh, in your select in your selection process, one of the questions is, um, are you using organics, mechanical, or any other lower level IPM strategies? You said you were ruthless, and one could assume what your selective means are when you're being ruthless. Um, but for the for the question's sake, you know, organics uh, or, are are um, miticides that are not synthetic, and mechanical means are uh, options like brood breaks or queen caging or uh, drone comb, um, drone culling and you know, things of that sort. Are you using any of those lower level IPM strategies? No, um, <clears throat> I'm adding drone combs to my standout colonies, but it's not to pull them out to reduce mites. It's so they make boatloads of drones, you know, which could aid a mite load, you know, if your bees aren't on top of things. But no, I don't use any, you know, sugar dusting. No, I basically just run bees and standard Langstroth equipment. You know, I'm about to switch to pallets. So I'm just running standard Langs. I make splits so they might get a brood break if they got split or if they got turned into a queen rearing colony. They might get a brood break. But other than that, no, I just let the queens run and 
just manage them like you would for honey, you know, give them space, put them in a big double deep colony and stack medium supers on top of it, you know, but no, no, I'm not trying to intervene with the mites in any way. No oils, no feed stimulants. You know, I'll occasionally use like, a, I'll put those open feeders out with like, what's that? stuff that man like sells that's in the powder the high protein stuff the pollen sub yeah what is that b pro maybe i'll occasionally put that out like an open feeders but i mean that's just to tell me whenever the pollen natural pollen shuts off you know because they'll get in it and then i know if i'm raising queens i'm gonna be paddling upstream but no i don't i don't do anything for mites so this kind of piggybacks a little bit on what you referenced when people are using the virgins that say that would come out of your operation in other areas of the country. Mm -hmm. um, when releasing virgins into queenless nukes, do you have any cautions or special instructions? So um, we've been doing that with excellent success, but we're not sure where the gotchas are. You're not sure where the what? The gotchas are. What, what extreme cautions you, 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 would, you would maybe uh, experience? <laughs> I feel like I've challenged a lot of stuff, like a lot of industries terms that people just start repeating this something somebody said, you know, that had some truth to it, maybe, but like a lot of people say, well, after a couple of days or after a week, you know, those virgins lose the urge to mate, you know, or, and I think they are a little bit trickier to introduce, but if you follow my, the Stevens queen introduction method, it's not an issue. I mean, I've accidentally forgotten uh, virgins that I'd banked for 3.5 weeks, so almost uh, almost four weeks, and I used them, and they worked perfectly fine. Like, I did the same thing last year just to see if that was a fluke, and I used some that were three weeks or a little bit older that had been in my incubator, and one of them looked like it was going to maybe start shooting a couple drones, you know, like maybe she was going to be a drone layer. And then she straightened out and had a perfect brood pattern. So, I mean, I'm not saying you should do that. And, you know, obviously they're not going to improve with age, like, you know, your fine wines, but as long as there's no eggs and there's no young larvae in there, you don't want it broodless necessarily, which that could work. But if you're getting really, really queenless, like, they start to be unstable. You know, you don't want to wait that long. But if you hit that seven to nine days after you split and remove the queen cells, you can drop all the virgins in there or whatever. And you're going to have a really high take, I feel like. Unless the, you know, the winds are just not in your favor, which sometimes that happens in beekeeping. You know, you just don't get good mating success. And then you'll try it again the next week and it'll be just perfect take you know I, I don't have an explanation for that but i can tell you overall if you follow those rules and there's no eggs and there's no young larvae in there you can get away with a lot with so at the step at the seven to nine day mark when you knock down the swarm cells uh do you then directly release the virgin or do you still need to like wait an hour or maybe a day or more like you've knocked down the cells do this i got time to come back in an hour just candy releaser. Don't try to manually release her because <clears throat> after a virgin's a couple of days old, um, it's like they've had, you know, three monster energy drinks. They're just, and they want to fly. So you'll be out there. Yeah, you'll maybe get a couple of them in there, but inevitably somebody's going to fly the coop and it may or may not go in the nuke you want it to. So don't, just don't. <laughs> just True story. Yeah, just put, leave them in a candy cage, cut the cells. If the consistency is right on the candy, it'll probably be tomorrow before she's out. They'll know that they're screwed, you know, before they get through that candy, and then they'll be happy to see her whenever she's out. So that's the main thing. And that's a great question because, you know, a lot of people like to direct release or fool with them, but just cut it, drop them, cut, cut all your emergency cells, drop a candy cage in there and then just leave them alone for two and a half weeks or so. And then whenever you come back, cause you, you'll probably have some that get picked off by a bird or lost or who knows what it's beekeeping. So go back through about three weeks or so and make sure the ones that missed 
you know, you'll want to give that comb to the ones that made it or else you'll have a wax moth issue down the road. Good question. Yeah, so now last year, um, I think it was around May, the Sustainable Beekeepers Guild, I think we may have done about 40 to 60 queens, virgin queens from you. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we distributed those through uh, the Bee Guild and members were able to purchase those through the Bee Guild. And I personally wound up with, I believe it was nine. Uh, and I followed your recommendations on uh, queen introduction. And again, it's anecdotal, but following the method, I, I had a hundred percent take. And yeah. um, I was extremely pleased with that because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of anxiety when it comes to queen introduction because there's a lot riding on it, especially if you only have a couple colonies, you know, it could really set you back. So yeah. it was a really successful take. I was very pleased with the outcome and I followed it to a T. It worked out perfectly. And thankfully nobody got picked off by dragonflies or birds on the way back. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of people, like I said, high level beekeepers that know their stuff that I've told that to. And they look at me funny, like, but I'm telling you, like I've got years of experience. It took me a lot of time to figure that out. And it cracks me up too. It makes me think of Dan Purvis. He uh, was one of my breeding mentors. He was always doing awesome things with the bees, but like I was out visiting him and when we were out in Colorado, you know, and I was like, I got a, this thing I came up with, you know, to get virgins introduced. And Dan goes, Corey, if anybody comes up with a great way to get virgins introduced, they'll be a rich man. Uh -huh. I'm going to hold you to that, Dan, because I am not been able to quit my day job yet. So I don't know that that was true, but you know, maybe, maybe it is more profitable. So you may not be a rich man, but I think too, that there's, you'll get industry pushback because it's a kind of a newer thing. But if you use the method of intro or recommend that to people, you know, I've, I'll put out more YouTube stuff where you can check it out and have an easy link. But I've got a blog post on my website, um, you know, that covers it, too. So if anybody orders virgins, like definitely check that out and make sure you've got your your process down. But yeah, while it might be, a, it is a profitable venture and it's a good business model and it works out for the producer. It, it, it has the caveat of, you know, um, overcoming the stigma that Virgin Queens aren't going to be, um, they're not going to be productive, but you got, or they're not going to be easily introduced and productive for you. Like, but you right. have, you have the benefit of open mating them to local stock. So you're also introducing some of those local genetics that you may already have in your current breeding program as well as in the existing drone congregation areas that you have. So you've got an opportunity to kind of flood your area with these VSH genetics that are coming out of those virgin queens, because it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the, 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 the alleles that are coming from your F1s, say I buy a virgin from you, the alleles that are coming from her are going to create drones with high, that VSH uh, allele right. and, and, and kind of put that into the breeding uh, breeding region, right? Yep. If I did my job, <clears throat> and which most of these girls are going to test extremely high, if I did my job, it doesn't matter what that virgin open mates to. Like if you go into a yard of 40 colonies and you requeen every single one of them with one of my queens with a high ex VSH expressing queen, virgin, it doesn't matter what she open mates to. You know, you're going to get, you're right, you're going to get that brood nest. That's a little bit of what you've been working with. So it's a blend immediately. And it, you're going to get some hybrid vigor or heterosis. If people have studied animal science or breeding, you know, heterosis will sound familiar. It's basically like if you have an Angus bull and you breed Charlay cows back to it, um, they just, they're more vigorous, those high, that hybrid vigor. So you're outcrossing whatever I sent to you. So you're immediately getting like a localized B because it's half what you have and half VSH, but all the drones that they produce should be VSH because, you know, drone eggs are unfertilized. So it's a recombinated set of their mother's DNA. So if she's a VSH lady, 
she, there, those colonies, the all 40 of those colonies are just going to be blowing BSH drones out the whole growing season. And, you know, it's going to affect your local population too. So, yeah, I mean, there's big advantages to it. You know, the main thing I would say if you're selling virgins is you better have high quality queens and know what you're doing. And it'd really be good if you had something special, like your own little, whether you're selecting for VSH or you just got this Tennessee mountain bee that does really good out in Tennessee and it's gentle and it's productive, you know, if you've got something you're working on that, you know, people want your stock, that'll, that'll make it easier for them to uh, accept virgins because it's kind of a, I went against industry standards whenever I started doing that. The only person I've ever really seen do that was Adam at VP Queens. I mean, back in the day, he was selling virgins for 25 bucks a piece. So, but I don't know. I don't even remember what he recommended for introduction. I know it wasn't what I've been chattering about tonight, but. So are they, are these virgins, once I get them, are they magic bullets or do I need to continue doing some sort of monitoring or, um, you know, uh, VSH testing on them? And, and, and what would it be, would it be, what kind of testing would, uh, would be best for, let's say a hobbyist or small scale operation? I mean, it depends on what you're wanting to do. You know, if you're, um, you know, standard IPM would still apply. Like, you know, if you're in a super high, high pressure area, even if they're effective, if they're minimizing mite reproduction, but you're getting overrun, you know, I mean, some people may want to treat them. A lot of my buddies that run them, treat them regardless, but they're commercial guys, you know, it's just kind of what they do. It's just their business model. But I, I would advise people if they got some of my stock to, yeah, definitely test them and look for the high scoring ones. Because like I said, you know, they should, definitely compared to ABC bees will have a way higher BSH scores, but you're going to find some that, you know, maybe are threes, they're not fours, or you may even find one that lost the genetic lottery and it's a two, you know, it would be a cull in my opinion. But the longer I run my program, I think the less I'll have outliers, you know, but you're still probably in any breeding program is going to have culls. So I would say, outcross them to your local bees keep like do a vsh test and then that's the number one question people ask me is like how long does it stay in your population before it muddies out and the answer is it depends <laughs> you know are you testing for it are you grafting out of daughters that scored high and then going back and testing the best of those daughters and grafting out of the ones that score high if you keep that selection pressure on, it doesn't have to go away at all. You know, you should be able to keep it high and you'll have your own little um, locally selected VSH, you know, your Michigan VSH or wherever it is that you're selecting from. So I would totally keep selection pressure on it and keep breeding from the ones that do well for you. And then you kind of have your own little unique signature uh, VSHB. Um, so when you mentioned the pollen sub, the, so the Ultra B or B Pro, it was evading me. Somebody popped that yeah, up in the question. Ultra B. Um, do you use that to, did you say that you use that to test when pollen is lacking in the wild? And mm -hmm. is this to know when pollen arrives in the spring so you can time your queen rearing? My, we got pollen right now, actually. I mean, it's not so much <clears throat> in spring I can bank on pollen. Like I don't have to, I don't supplement protein. It's basically whenever I'm getting around June and sometimes mid June, it's like someone flipped a switch off. And once that pollen quits coming in, like good luck queen rearing, you know, you start working real hard for not a lot of payoff. So basically the bees tell me when to start queen rearing when they start making queen cells. And then whenever I start hitting that dearth, you know, around mid June to July. Um, it's it's over. It's time to hang it up. I'm usually ragged out. The bees are ragged out, and we're ready for a break. But to answer your question, that pollen sub, I'll put it in those big feeders, and I won't see a bee on it for most of the time. But whenever I hit that nutritional darth whenever there's no nectar or no pollen coming in that thing looks like there's somebody shook a swarm on it <clears throat> and whenever those bees start working that sub like my queen rearing days are done 
So it's kind of a litmus test for me as, as much or more than it is filling in those nutritional valleys, you know, which it does that too. It's better than nothing, but that's the main, main thing. What's the minimum amount of frames of brood you would recommend installing in a nuke to let them go hopelessly queenless? Is two enough? I mean, you can get away with a frame of frame of brood and a frame of food. You know, I've made one frame splits that, you know, had both on it, but I like making them, you know, four or five frame splits. So as soon as that queen hits, they're, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and you're, you're running deep equipment too. So like I... I'm running medium, so I would I would use two, at least two. Uh, yeah, at least two. That's, that's a good, but I mean, there's not a set number, you know, it just depends on what you're wanting to do. Sometimes I'll make 10 frame splits, like whenever I've got cell builders that I'm retiring and they're double deeps, I'll just cut them straight into and drop virgin queens in. And, you know, a lot of times I'll just throw an excluder on it and then put supers on it. And then once that queen hits, like they're you're immediately in the supers. So it, it depends, you know, at least two frames is probably a good rule of thumb. So it seems like VSH is kind of like a relative term when it comes to the types of behaviors you will see. And there's been some, it, for those that are probably familiar, like SMR versus VSH, what are the unique characteristics that differentiate the two? Um, are your yeah. VSH bees uncapping and recapping brood? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's the thing i'm glad you mentioned that like you know back in the day whenever they first found the vsh trait they called it smr because they're like we have no idea what's going on but those bees are somehow suppressing my reproduction so smr suppress my reproduction and then they figured out it was a hygiene mechanism so they changed it to varroa sensitive hygiene because they noticed they were specifically targeting varroa but then, like I said, too, you get viral, viral resistance and other benefits from it as well. But whenever you do a VSH assay, you're measuring SMR. So if you're, it's kind of confusing, but if you're, if you're, if you're score, using a Harbo VSH assay, you are technically scoring your bee's ability to naturally suppress mite reproduction. So you can call them SMR. You know, I may revive the term and just start saying SMR just because I think there's some scientists that are kind of, it feels like they're trying to hijack the term to mean suppress my reproduction, but like a brood effect, you know, like the brood aren't as attractive or the brood somehow inhibit my reproduction i don't even think they have that articulated so my point with that is is they should probably find another term because i think vsh and smr are so tightly tied that that term's already taken you know what was i even talking about i rambled about that but <clears throat> i'm glad we touched on it yeah um so does Adding drone frames to BSH colonies help your drone congregation area since most of us are open mating. Yeah, definitely will. Cause they'll just lay sheets of drones, you know, whenever, whenever the time's right, when nutrition's really good in the spring and I'm doing instrumental insemination. So, you know, it'll work just the same if you're open mating and I, I like loads of drones. So whenever I time it, you know, when I'm catching them, I don't have a shortage of them. That, uh, but I mean, you got to watch it too, because if you don't have a lot of VSH and you're adding drone combs, like you're probably gonna, I mean, you could add to your myot loads. So I think if my historical recall is accurate, back in 2018, you were probably doing about well, 120 colonies and like a thousand queens a year. Yeah. That yeah, for a long time, I was averaging about a thousand queens a year, and then it kept creeping up and people kept buying them more, so I kept up in production. The last few years, it's been where I'm doing 2,000 plus, you know, between 2,000 and 2,500, and I'm doing less breeders this year. I kind of alluded to a project I was working on. <clears throat> so this year I may even push it up. I may try to get around 3000 or more, 
and really push the envelope on how many virgins I can produce out of my out of my apiary of my size. But the project I was talking about is I feel like I've got an X, like it's, I felt like it's come together, like years of working, like I had to become a master queen rearer. I mean, a master queen rearer. Because if you're going to try to do instrumental insemination, if you can't produce queens on a schedule, that's just ridiculous. So, and then I got that. And then I brought in stock that I, you know, I kept bringing in VSH stock. Well, it, cause I just wasn't testing. I'm like, I got to keep bringing it in cause I got to keep the frequency high. But once I figured out how to test it, then I realized that even some of the breeder, breeding stock that's, a, you know, advertised as VSH, like he, most of it has VSH traits, but may not be, even the breeders may not be pushing pores, you know, like a completely shutting down my reproduction. So, you know, I don't know where I was going with that, but your, your project, my project, I feel like my breeding program has come together. Like it's really working now. Um, but I'm, I always want to get better. I'm never satisfied. And so I felt like if I was a scientist looking at my breeding operation critically, what's my, what's my drawback or what's my weakness that's keeping me from being a world-class breeding operation? Cause that's what I want to be. I want to be world-class. You're going to do something, do it right or don't do it at all. So my, what I'm missing <clears throat> is I'm only running 150, 160 colonies. So what I'm missing is selection size or mass selection. So I've got, like I said, I've got a lot of buddies that are commercial beekeepers and several of them were already running my stock, you know, buying breeders every year from me. And so <laughs> I did a cost analysis on my breeders. I'm like, oh, let's see how much I made from six weeks of suffering. And I was sorely disappointed. And like I could produce one big round of virgins and equal my concentrated breeding stock that I'm selling off is just... It was just deflating and like in frustration i'm like okay well i'm just not gonna do that but i'm gonna be making some for myself anyway i'll i talk to a couple buddies i'm like hey what if i send you breeders to send them to you and you make as many daughters as you possibly can and just run them you know, like just beat them up. I'm not asking them to change the way they operate. I'm not asking them to change their uh, treatment schedule, anything, just crush them. Like send them to California, let them pollinate almonds, bring them back, make splits, you know, commercial selection criteria. And so the deal is I'm giving you breeders here and you know, we may change this going forward, but this is just the simple, what we're initiating this year. I'll send you breeders. You make a ton of daughters, crush them. Whenever you're going to split or do whatever in the springtime, pick the biggest, strongest colonies you've got that were my queens and send me those F1 daughters back in return. And I'll put them in nukes and I'll let Mother Nature take her gloves off. And then we're going to VSH test them. And then I'll use those f1 daughters that have been around the world and back i'll use those to produce drones because i know they'll be vsh drones it doesn't matter what they open mated to and then i'll test them and like i'll pick the ones that are the highest vsh and then i'll catch drones out of them inseminate the next round of queens send the queens out you guys do your thing of making bazillions of bees and pollinating and all the rigors of commercial production and then send me the best uh, sample of the best daughters again, and then repeat. So, and I think that well, I'm already having good luck. Like one of them that works with me, you know, like on the commercial B page already said, like, you know, I still treat, but he goes, they seem to keep much lower mite loads. He said in another thread, he said his in production increased. He said his winter survival has gone down, like he's having more bees come through winter, and he sends bees to almonds. He said his frame or his percentage of colonies that make grade, so they're big enough with enough frames to send to almonds, has gone up. And he's been using my breeders for three years. So something's already working. 
And I think to take it to the next level, that's what we're going to do. And then I think that will, I think it has potential to create like a world-class breeding operation. And that's not just my doing, you know, it's them doing the hard, brutal work of <clears throat> commercial beekeeping and then just kind of capitalizing on some of that uh, rigorous, you know, what those bees are asked to do on a commercial circuit. I think that's why the original Paul lines were so good is because that's what they did with those. Um, you know, I'm not the USDA and I don't have a giant budget, so I'm still trying to sort out, you know, how to expand it or monetize it or whatever, but that's the that's what's happening this year. So, so it's a, you know, a, a vital application really in, in the commercial sense. And you've done a lot of work with commercial uh, beekeepers uh, with your particular genetics is that, you know, you're reducing their need for consistent treatment or, or, or having to treat more than is necessary because the mite loads are lower which is beneficial to them, but beneficial to everybody else in the beekeeping community. Absolutely. Um, and, Never. you know, also to kind of make mention of, um, you, have to give, you have to give some credit where credit's due. Michigan beekeeping um, has a long, illustrious history. And if it weren't for Michigan beekeeping, at least, uh, and, and beekeeping research, um, Dr. Ruthenbuehler, I think is how, how you say his name. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, was was responsible for finding the SMR, uh, and without that, there there's no Corey Stevens. Actually, Rothenbuehler found hygiene, so he was like before Marla Spivak was cool. He learned this stuff back in the back in the day with but John Harbo. Well, he was using cyano gas to freeze kill brood, Rothenbuehler was. So he found hygiene and found AFB resistant. Like if you look at his brown line studies, I mean, Rothenbuehler is a complete rock star. But John Harbo found SMR or in VSH. That's, uh, he's the godfather of VSH. And they so, did a lot of work together in Michigan. Did they really? Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. So just giving Michigan some props there. Good job, Michigan. Yeah, yeah, rock on. I mean, without those dudes, I wouldn't know. I mean, I might be a good queen rearer, but <clears throat> I don't know that my stock would be any different or more stand out than anybody else's. But I mean, think with those guys' contributions, you know, like we could potentially change the game. I mean. Just so you are going to be offering, you are actually offering your queens now, right? Um, yeah, you can buy virgins. I'm just being... As a, for reasons I stated earlier, I'm being super tight with breeding stock because I want to hoard a whole bunch for myself. And then I've got to supply my buddies and you know, my commercial buddies that agreed to test slash crush, you know, this stock and send me some, send me the standouts. But yeah, so breeder queens, I may not have, I'll just have to see where I shake out, but you can buy virgin queens from my breeders. And, uh, when are you looking to start shipping those? Um, usually, I just say late April. Sometimes it's mid-April. But late April through mid-June, all of my stuff ships. You know, occasionally I'll run a little bit closer to July, but dang, man, you're getting some heat. You know, whenever you're pushing it that far, if it's going north, and I ship next day air, so I'll get them there alive, but man, it just gets harder on them in those brown EPS trucks. You know, so pretty much everything ships between late April and mid June, and I'm in Southeast Missouri, so that's my season. Inquiring minds want to know, and you know, this will probably kind of round out the questions. I think, uh, when are you going to have an initial public stock offering uh, in your queen rearing processes, so that you know those who are wanting to get involved can help support your efforts? You know, that's a good question. I, I was actually brainstorming on that today. Because I, I think that what I'm doing with my commercial buddies has a huge potential, but also like, I think like, I'm not going to stop there, you know, and there's people that have bought my breeders that aren't com technically commercial or they're just strong sideliners, you know, I'd like to be able to, you know, maybe network with them too. So who knows how many colonies we could be selecting out of, you know, it could be 10,000 plus. 
of course it may be 10,000 plus already uh, depends on a couple of the people working in my my little co-op but I don't know I'm still if you have ideas on this I mean this is keeping me stuck in my day job for now I feel like I'm getting close to where I could break out of it but <clears throat> if I could find some way to work with you know even sideliners as well to where they're I don't know if they would do like a patreon support i'm planning on start starting a patreon page but somehow fund it to where they're getting breeding stock and they could even if they so choose you know if you, they could send like standout f1 daughters back to me you know to where we're initiating that where you're getting good stock but you're also participating and furthering the stock you know i mean i think there's potential there I'm not a computer guy necessarily, but I think, you know, uh, crowdsource funding, maybe something along those lines to where it's like a giant network, you know, where we're all kind of working together and then I could be the hub maybe. Um, I don't know. This is just, yeah, that's the recommendation. Crowdfund it. Corey, go, yeah. go live and go live with the IPO. I, we'll see what happens. I want yeah. to backtrack a little bit. I mixed up the names. Um, Megan corrected it for me. Uh, it was Roger Hoopengarner that worked with Harbo, uh, yeah, Harbo yeah. on the SMR. You're right, because I think Roth and Bueller, because I learned from Sue Kobe, and I think she was at Ohio State maybe, and I think she was working out of the Roth and Bueller lab. So I think, I mean, you can't claim Roth and Bueller, but being able to claim Hoopengarner, I'd take that, James. That was my error. That's, yeah. my error. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, you're welcome. And so, so you can get we you can get Virgin Queens from Corey. You can actually place your orders now. Um, his his uh, store is active. You can per, you can put in orders for your Virgin Queens. And then, yeah. if you're local to southeastern Michigan, um, and there may be other opportunities throughout throughout the course of the uh, the month of May, we may do some other um, pickups. But the Sustainable Beekeepers Guild will be sponsoring a couple of uh, group queen orders. You can also go through the website. So if you're if you're on the newsletter or you're familiar with our media um, presence, you can check there too. Uh, we'll let you know when those dates are. Actually, here within the week, we'll be publishing that information, so you can stay tuned there. But by all means, if you're not local, you can order direct from Corey. We'll ship direct to you. Correct. Yeah, I put my website on there, StevensBeco.com. <clears throat> you know, you can order through that if you'd like. If you got questions, I mean, I troubleshoot for a lot of people. I answer a lot of questions to people. I have no idea who they are or where they're at at times, but I try to help out where I can. So you can email me with questions. Um, I do Facebook, Instagram, not quite as much, but the two are linked. So I at least have some stuff going on Instagram, like just my name or Stevens Bico, and then YouTube. That's something I'm trying to get um, educational conversations I'm trying to get more and more of them on there. So, and now that I've, I'm done with school and my master's degree and all that stuff, like I'll try to do a better job this year of putting more content on. So, and then maybe if I can figure out something with Patreon, you know, uh, if you want to support there, hopefully that'll be up soon. So, but it'll be connected to my website. So if you keep an eye on that. Yeah, I was just going to say, everybody, you know, take advantage of the offer to get a hold of Corey before he puts it all behind the Patreon. <laughs> Get the information while it's good. Corey, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you uh, talking with us tonight. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, we always enjoy having you. Um, you did the conference for us last year, too. Um, and uh, we, um, we really appreciate the help and the knowledge from your experience that can make this kind of thing accessible for even your, you know, Joe Bob Tumbleweed beekeepers. So, uh, again, thank you. Thank you very much. We do appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks for the invite. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. And topics. for everybody else. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say it's topics I'm passionate about. And I I try to speak from experience, not from theory, because those are two vastly different things. So yeah, thanks for letting me talk about all that. Yeah, yeah. Feelings, not facts, right? Or facts, not feelings. Wait, which exactly. one is it? Thank you. Yep. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Be sure to check out the B Guild for the recording. If you're a member, we'll put that up there as soon as we're ready to process it. And have a good night.